Hello, my name is Krista Phillips. The book I'm going to tell you about is called We Are Anora, A True Story of Surviving Multiple Personality Disorder by P.S. Morrow. It is the story of Anora Garrison, a small town wife and mom. She worked part-time in a hospital and was ex-military. She lived in a small town in New England with her husband and two children. We come to find out that even though her life looks fairly normal to others, she is secretly suffering from symptoms of DID, Dissociative Anxiety Disorder. This is Dissociative Identity Disorder. This is defined as a condition wherein a person's identity is fragmented into two or more distinct personalities. Sufferers of this condition are usually victims of severe abuse or trauma and or veterans of a war, or they might have been the witnesses to such things. Even though there is a lot of skepticism regarding this disorder, brain imaging studies are corroborating the personal accounts of people who have experienced these identity transformation transitions, and the accounts are often confirmed with objective evidence. In Honora's case, it was all too real. Her story begins with her running some normal errands, just living her seemingly normal life. She was buying stamps at the post office and mentally planning her family's 4th of July celebration when she slipped deeply into a slice of memory and her present reality melted away for a few minutes. She was back in a memory of her childhood and anxiety seized her. It was revealed that she was frequently losing substantial amounts of time. She would often sort of wake up in places without having any idea how she got there. She would find strange music CDs in her car that she didn't listen to, sometimes some she had never even heard of. Her husband and two children often experienced conversations with her that she would have no memory of. And sometimes people who were strangers to her would greet her as if they were best friends, even knowing about her family and intimate details of their life. These kind of events began to come more commonplace. She even began to get a little bit paranoid, thinking that people were out to get her and intentionally messing with her mind. All of these things are very common symptoms of DID. The beginning of the end finally came when her husband, Blaine, insisted that they see a marriage counselor. They had just had another argument because she had been yelling at him, yet again, for some petty disagreements, and she had no recollection of the conversation at all. She accused him of lying about the whole thing. Blaine was at his wit's end. He was beside himself. He didn't know what to think. He loved his wife, but this was getting to be too much for him to handle. So he insisted on a couple's therapy. She was very resistant to the fact and reluctant to go, but she was terrified to lose her marriage. The first few sessions didn't go too well at all. Meanwhile, she was having episodes of extreme vertigo and nausea and fainting spells. She thought she had a brain tumor or something and spent a lot of time at the emergency room. Her doctor finally diagnosed her with panic disorder and sent her to a specialist who specialized in these kind of disorders. She then was diagnosed and received medication for anxiety and depression, which did seem to help a lot. At about this time, Wade, the marriage counselor, told them that he wanted to see them as separate patients for a while. He felt he could best help them if he worked with them individually. During all of this, her episodes of losing time continued, and she began to have some horrible, horrible memories from her childhood resurface. They were so intense that she felt like she was back in that situation again, back in the long ago moment reliving it. Memories that have been repressed can often surface in this way. When something traumatizing happens to a person, the mind can push it deep into a locked away part of the unconscious. Sometimes the memory can re-emerge into consciousness, and sometimes that can happen very suddenly and very powerfully. During her first private session with Wade, she was very uncomfortable, but nothing significant happened, and she returned to come, she returned the next week. During that next session, she began to say things, and when Wade questioned her about it, she did not remember saying them. She got very upset and accused Wade of playing tricks on her. He assured her that he wasn't and would have no reason to, and she, even though she was still upset, agreed to come to the next session. The next day, however, Wade called and asked her and Blaine to come in together. He needed to speak with them about something. When they arrived at their appointment, Wade told them that he was diagnosing Honora with dissociative anxiety disorder. Now, the DSM-5 specifies the following criteria, criteria for a diagnosis of DID. Number one, 
two or more distinct personality states must be present, each having its own pattern of perceiving, relating to, and thinking about the world and self. Number two, amnesia must occur, which is defined in gaps in remembering everyday events, traumatic events, and personal information. Number three, it must be creating stress or difficulty in the person's functioning. Number four, cultural or religious factors being the cause must be ruled out. Number five, the symptoms cannot be caused by direct effects of a substance or general medical condition. And Nora certainly seemed to meet all these criteria. In fact, at her last session, Wade spoke with someone inside her named Bobby, and Honora had no memory of it. He explained to them that disassociation is a type of defense mechanism. This happens when a person unknowingly blocks out stressors as a way to protect themselves from an overload of pain or stress. This is not a bad thing, it is just how some people handle stress. He explained to them that Bobby was what is known as an alter, and that during her episodes of losing time, what was happening was called switching. Her fragmented parts came out to do the talking for her. He continued to assure them that this was treatable and that Enora was not insane or schizophrenic. Often dissociative identity disorder and schizophrenia mimic each other as they do have some symptoms in common. But the one big difference is that schizophrenics do not have multiple identities. The most common symptom of schizophrenia is delusions, when the sufferer experiences things or situations that are not really happening. The DID sufferer, however, does not really experience delusions, rather they tend to experience time loss, memory flashbacks, trances, and out-of-body experiences where they feel as if they are not in control of their bodies. Often they are not aware that anything strange has happened except for their sense of time loss. At her next session with Wade, Anora began to have more memories surface and shared them with him. As some very, very, very painful memories of the abuse she suffered from her adoptive parents began to arise, she blacked out and one of her alters continued the story for her, unbeknownst to Anora. She came back and finished the story and told Wade the account of trying to escape her abusers and was then put back into the foster care system where she remained until she was 18, moving from family to family. In following sessions, much more was revealed about her abusive childhood, and her episodes became more and more frequent. At one point, she experienced an absolute compulsion, an actual need, to draw something. By her own admission, she could hardly draw a stick person, so this was very odd, but she couldn't not do it. What came out was an incredibly talented and detailed portrait of someone Honora had never seen before. She said it felt like being possessed, as if something or someone else was controlling her body. This is not at all uncommon for DID sufferers either. Sometimes alters have their own names, histories, self-perceptions, and talents. Sometimes people are aware of the existence of these alters, but most often not. Dissociative identity disorder used to be known as multiple personality disorder, but its name was changed because it was misleading. It is not as if the patients have a legion of personalities locked inside them fighting to get out. It is more like they lack any unified and stable identity. Their identity has been shattered into fragmented pieces, and these pieces form their own identities in order to cope with whatever was going on that the patient was unable to deal with. As her treatment continued, and Orrin Wade continued the, continued the work towards integrating, which is the aim of all treatment plans for this disorder. Many more instances of horrific abuse suffered at the hands of the adoptive parents. The mother starved her and beat her savagely, ostracizing her from other people, forcing her to stay in her room alone all of the time. The father sexually abused her and raping her continuously over the four years she spent with them. All of the alters came forward to talk to Wade at different times throughout her therapy and describe the different ways in which they had protected her over the years. Bobby, the only male in the first altar that Wade met, was protective of Honora, but was also filled with anger and rage. He liked very loud heavy metal music and was prone to cursing fits when he got upset. At one time, he became so upset and filled with rage that he cut Honora with a razor. This also is consistent with DID patients who will self-harm when feeling aggression or hostility. They are often self-damaging and suicidal, more so than any other psychological disorder but they are rarely aggressive or violent towards other people. 
That was one of Honora's big fears, that one of her altars would harm her children or someone else while she was blacked out. But Wade assured her that this was highly unlikely. The fact is that, that this disorder is a system built, built upon and born from self-preservation. None of them would be likely to do anything that would get her in trouble. They were, after all, pieces of herself. Many times, dissociation is looked at as a gift. Oftentimes, the abuse the person suffers is so severe and traumatic that the person might not survive, either physically or mentally, if they were unable to dissociate. As her memories became more frequent, so did the switching episodes. So much was being uncovered during sessions that, at Wade's suggestion, a Nora bought a tape recorder As she would listen to these parts of herself describe things to Wade that her body had experienced, the memories themselves became more tactile, as if she was actually in the situation again. Things felt as though they were getting worse instead of better. She began to have stranger experiences in which she had no idea who she was or her family was. One time she came home and thought she was trespassing at a stranger's house because she had no idea where her own home was. Although this was understandably terrifying to her, she was actually making a lot of progress towards full independence. Marriage was not doing well at all. Blaine seemed to be making things worse by, by being unsupportive and angry and doing things deliberately to upset her. More memories continued to surface regarding a doctor in some hospital. These got more and more intense until she finally revealed that even before she was adopted by the abuser, she had been a patient in a psychiatric ward where electroshock therapies were experimentally, experientially performed on her. Her mother had abandoned her as a baby and the orphanage where she lived allowed these experiments to be performed on children they deemed as unruly or troublesome. The altar that provided this memory, named Noble Rage, allowed Honora her biggest breakthrough of her life. After this was revealed, she was able to thank the altar for its protection and told it goodbye. She had re finally regained all of her life's memories and was from here either fortunately her marriage did not survive she had finally recovered but Blaine was unable to to do this with her he asked her for a divorce on Christmas morning of all times it was not nearly as painful as she had feared even the judge recognized that Blaine's responsibility was to love and support her in times of sickness as well as health and asked him if he would have reacted the same if she had cancer or another physical ailment at this, she felt even freer, knowing that she had not imagined his malice and that At her last session with Wade, he tried to talk to any other alters, but no one came. She had no sense of falling away or losing track of herself. She had finally integrated with all of her alters and was on a new path. She could see how throughout her life, she had been unconsciously choosing situations to recreate part of her childhood. This is called behavioral reenactment. Victims often respond with an unconscious return to the trauma without realizing that past damage was the cause of this. In, in Honora's case, I think that she was forcing, unconsciously forcing herself into integration by recreating similar environments as the one she was terrorized in as a child. She now lives a happy life. Her children have grown and she remarried a wonderful man who has helped her come to a place of peace and fulfillment within her life and within herself. She is fully recovered and this can be the case for almost all sufferers of DID. There are many examples of individuals who have fully recovered from this disorder and gone on to lead productive, happy, and even successful lives. Thank you.